Greetings once again from Bethel Baptist Church here in Prospect, Connecticut. Hope your summer's been going along well. Uh, today we have a message from the Word of God, all, always from the Word of God. Uh, when I say that, I mean always the King James Bible. Say that without reservation, and we gladly stand on that as truth, as Jesus himself is truth. All right, I want to speak to you today uh, from what the Lord Jesus Christ had to say about the Bible, what he had to say about the written word of God. Now, you have to understand that Jesus was near the end of the Old Testament times, even though the Gospels are put into the New Testament section of the, the Holy Bible. Uh, the Testament doesn't go into effect until the death of the testator, Jesus being the testator, the New Testament, the New Covenant, did not go into effect until he died. And of course, he rose again from the grave three days later, and he liveth forevermore, and he's going to come back as King of kings and Lord of lords, set up his own kingdom, and everyone will bow down to him and kneel the knee and proclaim him to be Lord of all. So the scriptures that Jesus talks about, the scriptures that Paul talks about, are not the New Testament writings, they are the Old Testament writings. And Jesus said to search the scriptures in John chapter 5, verse number 39, uh, for they speak of him. And so we look in the Old Testament and we find uh, truths in there that are proven out in the New Testament so we want to bring to you what Jesus said about the scriptures. We're going to forego a song today, and uh, just for the sake of time. Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 14. Heavenly Father, we ask you for grace as we read from your word. We pray, Lord, you'd uh, give us the understanding of the truths that we're about to read. We pray, Lord, that you'll be glorified and honored that you'll be exalted, Lord, and uh, we want to thank you for the messages from the Word of God. We want to thank you for the words. Uh, you said that you esteemed your words uh, even higher than your own name. So we thank you for that and ask you your blessings upon it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Matthew 15, verse number 1. I've got a new pair of glasses on. I want to see how they work up here. Then came Jesus... Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? It's always somebody going against the word of God, or what they think is the word of God, because he didn't say, Why do your disciples transgress the word of God? He says, Why do they transgress our traditions? Big difference between traditions and the word of God. And then he complained, For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Sounds like your mom. But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth mother, a father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Why do you say things like that? Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You hypocrites. <laughs> I wonder what Jesus would call many people who stand on the pulpit and preach. Uh, if, he, if he had to talk to them face to face, what would he say? Why have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition? Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah, that's Isaiah the prophet, prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And he called the multitude, and said unto them, Hear and understand, not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. 
Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So Jesus put a high worth on his words. In fact, he said that the words that we speak will judge us in the last day. So this is why we say we believe the Bible is God's word. We believe it is absolute truth. We believe there are no errors in it except for the errors of men that it describes in its pages. In Matthew chapter 15, verse number 12, it says, Then his disciples came to him and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Well, Bible believers are often accused of not having a sweet spirit they find fault with what we say the Bible says, and they find fault in how we say it. And now there are always plenty of religious leaders offended at the words of Jesus Christ. Sometimes they became so, so mad they attempted to kill him. Eventually they did, but not until God's timing was just right. We who stand for the authority of the Holy Word of God the King James 1611 authorized Bible are often criticized for having such a bad spirit, a mean spirit, as I mentioned before. Now, God is always right. That's our stance. God is always right. His precepts concerning everything are right. Isaiah 55 verse 8 tells us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. So, Men have their opinions, men have their imaginations, men have their considerations of what these things might mean, but we're going to take God at his word. We're not going to twist it, we're not going to rest it to our own destruction. We're going to take God at his word. He says these are his words, he's preserved them. So we're going to look at some of the things our Lord Jesus Christ said while he was in his earthly ministry, and uh, we're going to see just how sweetly uh, he came across to those who he addressed. We're going to begin by looking at what Jesus said concerning the Word of God. Now, you might be shocked at, at what he said. Many people are. In John chapter 8, verse number 47, the Bible says, He that is of God, and this is Jesus speaking, He that is of God heareth God's Word. His words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. So a lot of people who don't believe the Bible is God's word at all, let alone the King James Bible, of all, of all the versions. And so they get mightily upset. Well, what makes you think you know what God says? Well, we just take God, uh, God's word, what it says here. He has spoken. <clears throat> so we're going to uh, proclaim that truth out as best we can. Notice that Jesus said... It is a characteristic of God's people to hear God's word. They pay attention to what he says. They try to put into practice in their lives exactly what he says. They hear the words when they are comforting words, and they hear them when they are condemning words. In other words, when God's word tells us we're doing something wrong, we get condemned by that, and we get, up, we get convicted by that. And we repent and we try to do the right things that God would have us do. And then we, we line up with God and everything seems to go along harmoniously. Jesus also said that not hearing God's words was the cause of rejection by God himself of the one who won't hear his words. Keep in mind that most people attending church, they, they haven't heard enough of true Bible teaching and preaching to know that they must call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. They, many people who go to church think that uh, if they uh, eat a, a wafer uh, and think that turns into God, that they'll be saved, or they're, they've been baptized, that they'll be saved. And, and yet many, many just haven't heard enough of the Word of God taught that they need to call upon the name of the Lord in repentance. Romans chapter 10, verses 13 to 15, say this, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Not might be, might will consider it, but shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Well, how could you? 
You have to believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And then it says, how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? Now, of course, this is in the New Testament, but he's quoting from the Old Testament when he says, as it is written. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. You know, a lot of people go door to door and they knock on the door to have a, a little conversation with the people who live there. And many times they're rejected. You know, sometimes it's Jehovah Witnesses, sometimes it's the Mormons. Uh, I've never had a Catholic come to my door, knock on the door, never had a Lutheran show up and do that. But I've had Baptists come to my door. And uh, I, I commended them for what they were doing because they're preaching the truth. I waited to hear what they had to tell me. And I commended them for preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Everybody else preaches some, some strange gospel, the gospel that Paul, the apostle, warned us not to pay any attention to at all. So <clears throat> it goes on, it says, uh, and, and how shall they preach except they be sent? And so we go out into the world and we preach the gospel. Our road sign proclaims it, our videos proclaim it, our preaching and teaching proclaim the glorious gospel message. If you are offended by our bad spirit about the scriptures, you might be shocked by how and, and what Jesus said about the scriptures. So, in Mark chapter 7, in verse number 9, it says that Jesus said this, he said, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. So people replace the word of God with their traditions, their traditions of scholarship. Well, the scholars, you have to, if we can't figure out what the Bible says, we have to go to the scholars. And because the scholars, well, they know all there is to know about the scriptures. They know the original. Nobody knows the original. They know copies of the original. The originals don't even exist anymore. Anything you can find was nothing written in the first century at all. Uh, at least not according to the scriptures. Not even uh, the beloved Dead Sea Scrolls. So, uh, keeping our mind on track here, uh, there's traditions of scholarship that are both secular and religious in nature. There are traditions of society, uh, what they think about home life, uh, about one husband or one wife and children, uh, they, they really don't understand what the Bible says uh, uh, concerning what a family is to post, supposed to be consistent of. And so we have government leaders, we have uh, religious leaders who say, well, it's okay for this and it's okay for that. Listen, God's the one who set everything in motion. It's the man who messes it all up. And so we're living in an age where things are really messed up. They're kind of like the days of Noah that Jesus warned that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be, as so shall it also be the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the thing that we see today just shows it. It's not two mommies, it's not two daddies, uh, or, you know, love uh, makes a family or it takes a village to, to raise a child. It does not. It takes a parent who loves the word of God to raise a child properly. Many have done it without the Bible, and the kids sometimes turn out all right. But I will tell you the truth, mom, dad, you get a hold of a Bible, learn that Bible first before you try to teach it. But uh, that's the best advice you can get from me. And then there's traditions of science. Oh, science. When, when science gets involved, you know, you got to follow the science on this COVID business as well. First Timothy 6.20 says, Oh, Timothy, Paul writing to a young preacher boy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, and oppositions of science falsely so-called. So the warning has gone out that we, we're not supposed to trust science. Besides, something that is scientific can be repeated over and over again. It can be demonstrable. You can see it. You can be shown these truths. But things that are a lot of people call science, you can't... Evolution is one thing. <laughs> so evolution is something you've got to have more faith to believe in evolution than you do to believe that God just spoke it all into existence. Since the resurrection is the foundational truth of Bible Christianity, the so-called scientists of Paul's day 
were probably attempting to discredit the idea that one could actually rise from the dead. And there was a great argument against that. Evolution is a theory and a tradition. It's not a fact at all. And yet I was taught it as a fact in the fifth grade. So they were already corrupting my mind uh, with falsehoods of uh, this happened this way, that happened that way, you're just an animal, live like an animal. Then I go home and I try to live like an animal, my father would give me a spanking. And my mother would look at me very crossly. But what did Jesus say about his own words? What did Jesus say uh, that is, should be important to us about the things that he said? In John chapter 5, in verse number 38, Jesus said, And ye have not his word, God's word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, he's talking about himself, <coughs> God sent his son into the world, him ye believe not. And then over in John chapter 14, verses 23 and 24, he says, it says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, this is where you really can tell if somebody really loves the Lord. Because people can tell you, well, I know the Lord, or I love the Lord. But the proof is in the doing. So let's see what he, Jesus said. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not, keepeth not my sayings, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So Jesus is speaking here on behalf of the Father, and he's saying, my words, God's words are so important that when I'm speaking, I'm actually speaking the things that my Father wants me to say. Now those who keep God's word are those who are in love with the Lord. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my words. If you love me, you'll look for my coming again. If you love me, you'll watch your behavior. If you love me, you'll preach the gospel. Now, in, 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 with a fellowship with the Lord, you know, we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If you really want fellowship with the Lord, if you're just showing up to church on a Sunday morning, this could be any, I don't care where you go to church about this, what I'm about to say. But if you think you're just showing up in a church service on a Sunday morning gives you points with God, you are sadly mistaken. Jesus said, keep his words. Where? In your heart. Because that's where things come out. This is the issues of life come from the heart. <clears throat> so when things happen around about you, what do you do? You get all upset about the world world conditions? Do you get upset about the next uh, legislation that gets passed in, in Congress uh, that's against the Word of God? Does the, do those things bother you or is, or is everything okay? You need to find out what's okay with the Lord because He hates some things and He's going to take His vengeance on those things. But what did Jesus say about the Word of God when it comes to eternal punishment? People don't believe in hell. People who go to church don't even believe in hell. Some people go to church because they believe in hell. <laughs> I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> so I, I, heard that, I heard the way of salvation, to call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. And, and I did that, and he saved my soul. Then things changed for me. It wasn't my desire to one day be a preacher and uh, stand up here and preach to other people or make these videos. I'm compelled to do this by the love of God which constrains me, just like the Apostle Paul. So we preach the word, and we preach the word with enthusiasm and full belief of what we're saying, of what the word of God says. In John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus said, He that rejecteth me, now, and receiveth not my words, <laughs> so when you reject Christ, you reject his words. If you reject his words, you reject Christ. So you call yourself a Christian, but if, you're, if you reject the words of, God, of Jesus Christ, you don't belong to him, apparently. So he says, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So the word that Jesus spoke are going to judge you and me in the last day. 
It will destroy the wicked and the ungodly when he comes. Let's look at this in Revelation chapter 19, verse number 11 through 21. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. That's a capital F in Faithful and a capital T in True, a proper name. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. This is the meek and lowly Jesus that most people worship. He's now the warrior king. He's coming back to take vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Read that. Make sure you believe that. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. That's a capital W in that, in that title, the Word of God. That's a proper noun, proper name. That's the name of Jesus Christ. In, first, in John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was, uh, was God. In the beginning, <laughs> sometimes you repeat these verses so much, you, you forget how they go. You've got to kind of get a, you gotta prime the uh, brain here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. They're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word of God. And so he goes on, and he says, He was clothed in a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. You say, well, how does a sword come out of his mouth? That's a strange thing. Well, the Bible in Galatians tells us that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. So you're going to be slain by the Word of God, <laughs> the words that come out of his mouth. be interesting, though, truly to be a real sword and see what that does. But it's going to happen. It'll determine the eternal fate of, of the unsaved at, at what's called the Great White Throne Judgment. And Revelation 20 talks about a great judgment. Now, this is not the judgment of the believers. The believers are judged uh, prior to this time by a thousand seven years. And this one here is, though, after the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, the millennial reign. And in Revelation 20, verse 11, the Apostle John says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's going to declare uh, our works at the judgment seat of Christ. Now this is, this is the time just before the great tribulation where all the believers who died are going to come up out of the graves and meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4 verses 13 through 18. And then those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. We're to be comforting each other with those words, the believers anyway. And uh, we're going to be judged by how we responded to the words of Christ when it declared we should be doing this. What were we doing? Were we doing that or were we doing something else according to our own thinking? You know, did we, the things that we did for people, we, did we do it in the name of Jesus Christ or we did it just so we looked good? You see, it's all the motive, basically the motive. Why did you do what you did when you did it? That, I think that's pretty much going to cover what the judgment seat's going to be about. And there's going to be either rewards handed out by the Lord or going to be uh, you know, held back. And so there will be no extra blessing for you. Colossians 3.16 tells us to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly in all wisdom. How do you do that? You memorize it. If instead of filling your mind with junk and garbage and trash, which all the, that's all the world really has to offer, 
uh, except maybe in the beauty of nature, uh, in the creation itself, but to allow the Word of Christ to dwell in you richly. And as we continue on here, what about the time we spend in the, in the Bible? How much time do we give to reading the Word of God? Uh, sometimes we get so busy, and I find myself getting this way too often, too busy, and neglecting the Word of God, which is our source of spiritual energy and, and spiritual thirst and spiritual hunger. All those things are satisfied with the Word of God. Matthew 21, verse 42 says, Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Some people have never read parts of the Bible. I wonder if you've ever read that part in the Bible. That's Matthew chapter 21, <laughs> verse, 20, verse 42. Some of these people who don't bother with the Word of God are, are church leaders. They're in positions of authority in, in church assemblies. And they know less than the Bible than people who spend just a couple of months here at Bethel Baptist Church. Uh, these people probably know more about the Word of God if they've been paying attention than somebody who's just even gone through theological school. Because they really don't teach you the scriptures there. They teach you how to make these little, uh, I don't know, our daily bread type of uh, devotions. Which aren't bad, but they're not enough, really. So, some of, some of them are church leaders, many preachers, many deacons and Sunday school teachers have never read the Bible completely through, let alone a, a complete book. Uh, I, we try to make that uh, a priority here, that, that we, we know and believe the Word of God. Uh, some of them are really just lazy and, and they won't do it. Some are indifferent about it, which is probably most of the problem. But some of them love the wrong things, too. Some, so their minds are on other things than the Word of God. 1 John 2, 15, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, we're not talking about the earth. We're talking about the world, the world situation, what everybody gets involved in, environmentalism. We, we've been through the list over and over again. Proverbs 20, verse 13 tells us to love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Now, Jesus described his word as bread, bread for the soul. So, but what did Jesus have to say about the scriptures being reliable? Are they really the words of God? Are they truly reliable? Can we depend upon If we adjust our lives and our behavior to line up with the word of God, is there any real benefit to that? In Luke chapter 24, verse 25, it says, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Now he was talking about his resurrection here. But I'm going to go back to John chapter 5, verse 39, which I quoted earlier. Jesus said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life. He's talking about the Old Testament here. It's the only scriptures that were available at the time. He says, for they are they which testify of me. And you can find, you can't necessarily find Jesus Christ, the name Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, but there are many things that point to who this individual uh, was and is. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, well, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which ye receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. So he's talking to the Hebrew people, he's talking to the Jews who trusted in Moses, and they said, well, who are, you? are you better than Moses? And he said, greater than Moses is here. <laughs> for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So if, if we don't believe the Old Testament prophecies about Jesus Christ, how, how can we believe what Jesus said to be so? That's a hard, hard road to hope. As the farmers might say, are the scriptures reliable? Jesus said they are. 
Is that good enough for you? It's good enough for me. According to Jesus, a person is a fool who doesn't believe all of the Bible. That's right, even about Jonah, even about the Red Sea, all of the parting of the Red Sea, and the feeding of the 5,000, the resurrection of the dead, the resurrection of, of uh, uh, Lazarus, and the promises of yet to be fulfilled. That would include believing creation over evolution. That's right. Mark 13, 19, For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. That's what Jesus said. God created these things. Of course, in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, Jesus is the actual one, the word of God. Jesus also verified the Genesis account of Adam and Eve. Matthew 19, 14, And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read? That ye, that he which made them at the beginning, made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So there's you got modern society all twisting things up, you know, men wanting to be women, women wanting to be men, men wanting to be with men, women to be with women. And yet God didn't make it that way. So why is he allowed it to happen? Well, because he's, he lets people run their lives for themselves. And when you run your own life, you run it into the ground. But those of us who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, happy are we. <laughs> because we line up with the word of God. Man is basically sinful, not basically good. That's what the Bible tells us. Jesus understood everyone uh, because he knew all men in John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. He need not that any should testify of man to him. He knew what was in man. And Jesus confirmed that when he said in Mark chapter 7, verse 20 to 23, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. That's right. So if, if I start cursing and swearing and uh, calling you all kinds of names, that comes out of my heart, a heart full of hate. So he says, that which comes out of the man defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders. It's from the heart. Thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So the man who kills somebody with a handgun is not a gunman. He's a murderer. Just as a person who kills someone with a knife He's not a knife man, he's a murderer. Even if you choke someone to death, you're a murderer. If you kill the baby in the womb, you're a murderer. God said that. It makes sense. Too much sense for a lot of people. How about the catastrophic flood of Noah's day? Luke 17, 26. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the, of the Son of Man. The complete conflagration of Sodom and Gomorrah would have went up in smoke. Luke 12, uh, Luke 17, verse 20 says, Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot. They ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. And verse 29 says, But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. He says it's going to be just like that. And you can go back in Genesis chapter 6 and see what it was all about. Everybody did that which was right in their own eyes. Oh, it was a mess. We think the things are bad now. It was, it was bad back then too. What about what he said about being born again? Is this reliable? In John chapter 3, verse, verses 3 and 5. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then in verse 5 he says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So if, if you want to be saved, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you'll be born again. It's repentance toward God, rejecting everything but what God has said, what he's spoken that pertains to the church and being saved and repenting of that and turning to Jesus Christ for salvation. That's what that is. How necessary are the scriptures? Luke 4.4 4 says, it is written, and Jesus said it is written, 
Who did he say that to? <laughs> he said it to Satan, who was tempting him in the wilderness. He said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Now, that, that part there is all about, Jesus said, if you don't eat my flesh, you're no part of me. If you don't drink my blood, you're no part of me. And some churches, they get all messed up with that. They think they need to drink their literal blood of Jesus and the literal body of Christ. So they say some hocus pocus, dominocus, and think that they've done some magical transubstantiation of uh, just wafers and wine. And in their foolishness, they think that's his real body. Jesus said the things that he just told them about eating his body and drinking his blood are just, they're spiritual things he's talking about, not real fleshly things. He said the flesh profits nothing. So consuming that, thinking it's Jesus' body, it profits nothing. Okay, life comes from God's word. The Bible is able to give us life if we believe it. You have to have it if you are to have eternal life. You need them. The scriptures that you may believe may believe them and have eternal life for salvation in Romans 10 17 so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God without it how are you how are you gonna get saved I mean I could meet you out on the street and I could tell you the gospel it would be what it says but you know it's the word of God <laughs> you say well where'd you come up with that well I read the Bible well where is it well I don't have one well, how'd you learn it? Well, I had one at one time. One of these days, you know, the world wants to get rid of the Bible because they want to get rid of God. And if they can just get rid of the, God, uh, the Bible and God, they'll turn against the churches. And then they'll get rid of the churches. Because when the Antichrist sets up his kingdom, you won't have this stuff going on that we're doing right now. James 1.18 says, Of his own will begat I us with the word of truth, the word of God, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And then in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, he tells us, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So it's necessary not just to be born again and be saved, but it's also necessary for our spiritual strength and power. Acts 20, verse 32, it says this, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Sanctified, that's an important word. Sanctified for the master's use, set aside for holy purposes. You, your vessel, your body. And then John 17, 17, Jesus said to his Father in heaven as he prayed before he was taken, uh, brutally crucified, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And then lastly, for spiritual battle, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, your heart, my heart. Ephesians 6, 17 says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus knew what he was talking about because whenever Jesus spoke, it was important. And when Jesus speaks, everyone ought to listen because there's coming a day when Jesus sits upon that throne in Jerusalem on the throne of David and he sets up his earthly kingdom for a thousand years. When he speaks, everybody's going to kneel and they're going to obey. And if they don't, punishment follows. You really, if you're not saved, you really don't know what's, what's coming down. You, you, if you don't know the Bible, you don't know what, what's going to fall upon this earth until God makes it all new again. He's not, not going to rebuild it. He's going to make it all new. And what a place that will be then. I hope you're there with us. I hope that you uh, are striving to, and you're searching to, to find the truth. The truth is in the Bible. And when I say Bible, King James Bible, easy enough to read. Some things in here 
All right, a little bit tough to understand, but I tell you, ask God for light. Ask God to give you grace to understand his word. Now, that, not everything in here is for the Christian. It's for the Christian's edification. But the stuff for the believer and the Christian are mostly in the New Testament. So, but we learn the truths of the New Testament by reading the Old Testament because they speak of Jesus Christ, our coming Lord and Savior. Now, I pray you make him your Lord and Savior, the most important thing you could do. And you never know when you're going to draw your last breath. And so we, we compel you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. God bless you. Till next time, Pastor Ed signing out here in Prospect, Connecticut. Bye-bye.